My name is Aaron Blashis, and uh, I'm a senior product manager in the EUC group. Um, I focused on application virtualization for the past uh, few years. Um, I see some familiar faces. Uh, thank you for, for coming back. We hope that uh, you'll get to l learn something about, um, about ThinApp today. Um, joining me on stage is uh, Kobe Gurr. I'll let uh, Kobe inter introduce himself, but um, he is uh, now my counterpart. Uh, for everything that uh, that is application virtualization, we're growing. I don't know if they turn on my mic yet. Yeah, <laughs> so we're growing. Many PMs now on this product. Um, we've also got some some guests with us here today, so we'll we'll bring them up at the very end for some Q and A. But uh, what you saw in the keynote, we've got some of those founding folks in the room here with us, so um, we won't spoil the surprise just yet. Um, by day number two, hopefully. Uh, you, you, disclaimer, blah, 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 technical, feasibility, market, delivery, etc. cetera. Um, so I feel a little bit bad about the session today. And the reason I feel a little bit bad about it is, is that we, we broke it up into four groups. And the original name of it was, uh, so you think you know everything there is to know about ThinApp, right? And, and originally we had come out with this idea about going into a bunch of little hidden cool things that you could do. And then Steve Herod came to our group and said that he was going to uh, feature the ThinApp factory and Horizon integration and all kinds of things that hopefully you saw in the, in the keynote this morning, which we thought was, uh, was very exciting and, and, and not to be ignored, right? So uh, instead, what we broke it down into is, um, is four different little areas, which, which honestly, we could do an hour on each of them. But we're going to try and sort of give you an introduction to... Uh, to, to each of them, um, so that we and then host a, a Q and A session at the end. We're going to try and allow at least ten minutes for that, so you guys can can get out some questions about um, about some of the things that we're going to do. Um, principally, what we're very proud of, and this will be the first time that's uh, been spoken about in anything like this, is um, is uh, Thin App and Horizon, and um, and and what uh, what the next generation of application management for Thin App looks like, as well as um, Thin App Factory. Which, uh, which is a, a, a new way to, to use ThinApp to automate the process, and, but we'll go into that in more detail. So what is, um, what is ThinApp? How many people have you, I don't have to answer that question for? Excellent, okay. Um, the, but just for the, the remaining few that didn't raise your hands, uh, ThinApp is an application virtualization technology which um, uses snapshotting to wrap up um, Windows applications into f uh, single file executables so that they can be streamed over a local SIF share or uh, launched on a machine and they're just um, sitting in a local executable. It's distributed as a standalone product and as part of Vue. Now, moving on. Isolation modes. Now, we picked this topic to, um, to just go into with a little more detail and explain it because it is a key feature of application virtualization in ThinApp and probably the most, um, I would say, the, the number one thing that we run into when people ask us about um, uh, packaging tips. It is key to understand how isolation modes work if you're going to package your applications um, and, and it, I'm actually kind of surprised uh, how often uh, people um, people just sort of misunderstand what, what happens with it. So I thought we would take a little bit, bit of time to clear that up. So isolation modes are critical because what they do is they allow you to um, control the access that your virtual application has to the local operating system. So when you break into Windows application away from the operating system, it is key to make sure that you can... Uh, you know, what you're writing to, what you have access to. Um, and we do this at the file system and the registry system and, and all the subtrees. Now, by default, packages um, are con they're, they're controlled. They're configured for, for a lockdown desktop model, which means that um, the user doesn't have a lot of write access or control to the registry um, for the machines. And we did that to help... Um, to help customers uh, con better control the security, security environments on their desktops, as well as uh, one of the initial uh, use cases of the product was for, for terminal server and Citrix environments. Now, um, when, oh, hold on, I'm sorry, we, we, we run in user mode, and so if a user doesn't have access to, to change anything on their machine, 
then, uh, then you can actually use this, uh, the, the, the standard user policies to, to dictate uh, stronger controls on the machines. So while ThinApp itself is not necessarily a security product, it allows uh, customers to um, put in more uh, secure environments and control what they have access to. And the way that we do that, one of the ways we do that is, is through the three isolation modes, merge, write, copy, and full. So for the examples today, I'm going to use a physical file and a virtual file. Um, but it is important to understand, I'm just using these for examples. This it works the same, what I'm about to describe, as it does uh, isolation modes and control the same thing for registries. And I'm going to try and get through this rather quickly because we have a lot of good stuff at the end. So we have right now, we, as you can see, we have um, in red the virtual file and in black the physical file. And the virtual file temp directory is, sent, is set to merged. Now what that means is that if there is a conflict between a... Uh, uh, virtual file that is, is the same as the physical, the virtual will win. Uh, the virtual application will read the, the, the virtual file in, in a merge mode. If we have a non-conflicting instance, in this case a uh, virtual TXT, um, that instance is, exists or introduced and will exist in the sandbox. Um, however, Anything that exists, and this is hey.txt, and that is a Swedish, uh, or hello in Swedish, which is a whole other story you can ask me about later if you like. But um, if that is uh, introduced uh, by, the, by the virtual um, application on the physical machine, it will be seen on the physical environment. And this makes sense because you would want to set something like desktop or my pro or program files, um, or my documents, I'm sorry, to, to merged. A new instance will also exist, like I said, um, in, in the, on the physical machine and can be read by both the physical and the virtual environment. Write copy is exactly the same as merged up to a point where, um, where we introduce a new um, file on the, vir on, the, um, on the physical machine. It will be written in the sandbox. So it is written and then copied to the sandbox. And this is important for making sure that you can lock down uh, certain portions of your operating system. New, uh, new, uh, new files, like I said, will be, will be written to the sandbox. Full isolation mode, which is the final one, it, uh, is, is actually just, uh, doesn't allow the, um, vir the virtual application to see anything on the, uh, on the physical machine. Everything gets written um, into, into the sandbox. Now this, this is a very useful tool, however it, um, it can uh, throw people off a little bit. So if you're debugging your, your, uh, your uh, virtualized applications, this one will throw you off um, quite a bit because uh, things that it, uh, it would expect to see, that it can expect to write to um, on the, in the virtual application may not exist and it may not be able to, to read properly. Um, so, so check your isolation modes. And, and this is a very useful one, but it, it, uh, it often throws people off. These are just some examples of what um, the uh, isolation mode settings look like within, within a project file. As you can see, package.ini has isolation modes. That's the default, um, default, default directory isolation. Uh, we also have the attribute INI file in each, um, in each uh, file directory, which controls, um, and, the is controls and, and dictates the inheritance um, of, of isolation mode settings. The next little thing that I just want to go over to people, and, and uh, a question we get asked a lot is, how do you control the, um, the, the, the setup capture environment? Is there a way that you can customize it to your own uh, environment? And that is actually the snapshot.ini. What this is, is this is an exclusion list for setup capture. And it can be modified to fit your environment. This is really important for people that you'll be working with, especially in enterprises, where as often as we we recommend that you build on a clean machine. Some corporate policies dictate that you can't necessarily do that. Um, you have, you know, uh, antivirus logs or something like that that'll that'll uh, make your package wrong, or you have to go in and delete them every single time. You, this snapshot.ini, it's very easy to find um, in the in the setup capture folder of of, of ThinApp, and uh, you can change it and customize it in any way that uh, that you like. Now, um, okay, we're doing pretty good whipping through these. Um, SB merge. Now, this is not a hidden, um, hidden setting by any means, but 
As uh, anybody that has worked with Synapse for a long time, this is an extremely valuable tool if you've never, if you've never taken the time to, to look at this. Now, what it does is that as we, went, as we described um, isolation modes with, uh, just a moment ago, when we, we went over what gets written into the sandbox and what is not written into the sandbox and what is copied between the virtual and the physical, what SB Merge allows you to do is changes that are made from the executable, which remember, the executable is, um, is read-only. Right? So any changes that the application made get, get, get written off to the sandbox. So what SB Merge allows you to do is take those changes and then put them back in to the executable to create a new, uh, a new thin app. Um, this is the most efficient way to update a, um, a project. It is a very good way to test. Um, it is a very good way to, to modify executables. Um, so that you can reintroduce them into your environment if you just want to change one or two things, but uh, like the home page, but you don't want to have to go through the, the whole recapture process. It's also um, excellent for, for debugging. Um, so it's, it's a very good debugging tool. But you do want to make sure that you have as much as uh, your folders and your, um, your uh, registry directory set to write copy because that way you can make sure that things get written to the sandbox as well as um, to the physical machine. So you don't want to do this in merge mode. That's not going to help you very much. Um, also, just so you know, there is an exclude file. So the, the, the same thing that you can do with snapshot.ini, um, you can do with this exclude file.ini in SB merge, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which is very useful. So another thing that um, I get questions about a lot is uh, the pop-up bar. How many of you have ever thought, what, what, do we, what is the pop-up bar for? Can I get rid of it? Show of hands. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. So let me, let me, uh, let me, let me clear this one up for you, too. Um, the pop-up bar is there at, it is required by the EULA, and it is there for the protection of VMware and as a protection of the customers um, that use ThinApp. And the reason it's there is because you need to make sure that you have some way of showing that you have a licensed copy of the software. Um, it, it, is, uh, it, it is protection for redistribution and many other things. Um, but one of the things that people ask us about is, is like, oh, well, I licensed it to this group, and now I don't want to have to change it and go back and recapture. And my ThinApp uh, project is licensed to, to uh, you know, uh, my, this partner Acme or something, and I'm giving it to another company. Uh, how do I go in and I change the display? Modifying the, set, the uh, setup bar is is uh, one of those things that it's uh, hidden deep in the manual. That's not uh, uh, in the in the package that I and I exposed. And there are many many uh, things that uh, that are such. But hopefully, I will be able to show you guys something a little bit later that will help um, help you find things like this. But I just picked this one as something else that you would be able to do. So you can change the, the status, bar, status bar display um, f to, to, uh, for your packaging to help show who it's licensed to. Um, in this case, you just set it equal to, um, to, to whatever you want, and then it changes the next time that it's popped up. So um, thank you for, I, I'm, like I said, I apologize. I had to rush, rush through that particular session. I hope you, or that part of the session, but I hope you did find it useful. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is the competition. So a, a question that all, all often comes up is, is that how are you different from the competition? And while I can get into a lengthy conversation with, uh, with, with you about the, the impacts of, or the different, the different ways that the architectures are designed and what impacts that has, um, instead we thought that we would give you guys some, some performance testing results that we recently, uh, we recently did and validated with an, with an outside company. Um, and we'll give you the, uh, part of the call to action, a, a place where you can go and verify that. But, but um, in order to, to go into the methodology and the results a little bit further, I'd like to introduce my office mate, actually, uh, Fred Shimsheimer from the Technical Marketing Group. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good. It works fine. Yes, I'm Fred Shimsheimer, and uh, maybe a few people have heard of me. I'm the author and the, uh, um, the author of uh, the ROC, the Reference Architecture Workload Code that uh, VMware uses. And uh, we had an opportunity recently, as Aaron had said, to uh, do some internal performance testing on AppV versus ThinApp. 
And the reason we came to this uh, to do this uh, point to do this testing is to basically see how our competition was doing. So what we did was we set up some servers inside VMware ourselves with at v, uh, packages 4.6 and uh, uh, at, and the thin at 4.6 as well, and we did everything on a Dell R710, uh, full of memory. I think it was 174 gigs, with a direct attached storage to an EMC Clarion, and we did 20 VMs in native applications for Windows 7. They're all 32-bit, uh, 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 one virtual CPU, and two gigs of main memory. So we tried to get everything uh, as even as possible. So we ran baseline numbers to begin with, and uh, what we did was we ran native then thin app, and then app v. And as you can see here, we have, uh, for native usage, this is 32 kilobytes per second average, and then for app v, they're a, little bit, they're a lot less, and then for thin app, we're under 13 kilobytes per second. And so we have uh, a resource utilization advantage over app v. Um, and like I said, the reason we wanted to do these studies is to get people familiar with uh, the advantages of thin app over app v. Then, but look at the dramatic uh, disk usage differences over here. So we have native. That V is very, hit the drives very hard. And we're going to talk about a third party vendor who actually <coughs> collaborated our uh, experience on this, who did a similar testing for us. Uh, network usage, again, at V uses, hits the network a lot harder than thin apps. And the disk usage over here was dramatic. It's up to 50%. Uh, and so what does that mean? If you're using 50% more uh, I.O. on a storage array, that means you can max out that storage array a lot faster than you actually can getting uh, the number of v VMs per core. So it, it, it comes down to dollars and cents. How many VMs can you pack on a server? So you have to look at memory, of course, and you have to look at IOPS, um, and you have to look at processor. But storage is one of the biggest things in VDI. Um, so... Uh, Before you skip to the next slide, Fred. Um, yeah. Now, in the context of um, of a thin app on on Vue, right? Yeah. So, when, I mean, architecturally speaking, uh, you know, thin apps are, are put off in a, in a storage array or storage environment, and then yeah. they're streamed into the Vue environments. Yes. So, how is this network? Um, you know, what can we? What, what information can we? Very good point, that? Aaron. So, uh, at these streams, it's data off. Of, you have to have a stream server and, and a sequencer. And we have none of that. So what's really nice about ThinApps, it's so autonomous. You, can, you don't need a streaming server or a sequencer. It's, you can run it anywhere. I can run IE6, IE7, IE8, and I don't need a streaming server. I don't need any uh, special uh, VMs to, to implement AppV. So very good point. And, so, yeah. uh, so one of the questions that we get often about this is, is that if I'm going to stream all of these applications um, into my view environment, do I need to worry about um, excessive network uh, impact? Yeah. Um, over the shift share, and one part of, of what the, um, this will go into great detail is that uh, the answer is um, is no that you don 't have to worry about it, especially since we 're only pulling when the application needs to make a call so um, I thought that this was something that uh, that you guys would like to see uh, we 're going to go into like I said uh, as part of the call to action we 'll we'll show you where you can get more information on the full results of this uh, of this white paper thanks right. a lot Fred thank you Eric. and uh, now Kobe. All right, so the, uh, the project that I'm working on right now is uh, ThinApp on the Horizon. Um, one of the most exciting things that we've, uh, we've done around ThinApp in, in, in a, a couple of years here, um, we're taking the advantages of, a, of deployment management and we're doing much more than just packaging. So what is ThinApp on the Horizon and what does this mean to us? Well, what it basically means is uh, it's gonna be this easy. Everybody should be familiar with this setup capture dialog. You'll notice that there's a new option down at the very bottom there. That option is manage with VMware Horizon Application Manager. When I check this box, what I have just done is, is told this package that it should now look for the Horizon agent to know whether it is entitled to this user or if he can or cannot run this. That's really going to be it from a thin app perspective, the amount of impact we'll put on you. So if you want it to be managed by Horizon, you check the box. If you don't, it's just business as usual. It'll work just like it would a normal uh, thin app package. Um, there's gonna be a lot more detail given into the architecture of Horizon. Um, one of the call to actions is that there's a session in two hours that goes into more detail on the architecture of Horizon. So I'm gonna cover some, but I'm not gonna go as detailed as, as they would. 
But let's take a look at how this all kind of marries together. So we've gone through and we've made our Synap Horizon package. I want this to be managed by Horizon. The next thing that I'm going to do is my Synap uh, on Horizon, first off, out of the gate, what are we going to provide? Well, initially, it's going to be the ability to deliver these Synaps. It's also going to be the ability to entitle, and entitle by groups and entitle by users. So, um, you know, in, in, the, in the view environment today, we can entitle by pools and machines. Using Horizon, you'd now be able to entitle by users and groups. So that's something to think about as well. So we've got our ThinApp package. I've got it set up just the way I want it. I've, uh, I've, I've told it to uh, look for the Horizon agent. It's going to be a managed application. The next thing that I'm going to do as part of my environment, and this is on-premise, is I'm going to set up the SIF share. And I'm going to tell Horizon, this is where my ThinApps are going to be. Um, what we do is we put in the, the UNC path to our SIF share. From that, the Horizon service, the repository service connector, will go down and scan that environment. It'll scan that directory that I've set up, come back, and take the metadata of those packages. Now, we're not taking the entire package and pulling it back up to the cloud. We're not doing that. We're just taking the metadata, information about that package, so that we can make the decisions on who do I tie this application to um, and, 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 and how is this going to be delivered to them. So just the metadata. Now you're looking at um, the Horizon Administrative Console. So we've got the metadata up there. You'll see that there are some packages up there, Office Professional 2007, um, as well as there can be uh, SaaS-based applications up here like Box.net, other things of that nature. Um, the real thing that we're introducing in, in the second um, introduction with Horizon is the introduction of those thin apps. So I'm going to focus mainly on that. So we take this Horizon uh, application, we pick our office, uh, our, our office application, and we need to make the decision, how do we want this entitled to the user? We have two options initially. Um, in my environment, we, we, we've selected uh, five applications here. Some of them I've said, you know, this is a user-activated application. Others, I want it just to automatically entitle. Now, what does that mean? That means that if I set it to automatically, the icons are going to appear, the shortcuts are going to appear, everything is going to be just as though that user natively received that application installed. Now, one of the most commonly um, over-deployed apps and underutilized is, is Visio. Um, one option could be that I set Visio to be user activated so that I don't really want to consume a license until that user actually needs that license. So there's an option when I do user activated, um, we'll get there in just a second, with the catalog, and I'll show you the catalog. But down on the end user, we, we've gone ahead and we've said, here are my applications. What is the end user experience going to feel like? Well, as I mentioned, the icons will appear. They will go into the start menu, program groups, all of that. But in addition, there's an icon down in the system tray. This is my Horizon App Manager icon. I can right-click it, and I can see the status of those applications that have been entitled to me. So we're looking at here, we've got Adobe, uh, which is a thin app application. We've got an ADP portal, Box.net. Those both are SaaS-based applications. And then we've got Microsoft Office Professional. Now, the checkbox that says local, what that means is the, when we initially start the entitlement, the application, the thin app, will start to stream down so that if the user wanted to run it right now, you know, I need my Adobe Reader, they click on that icon, it's going to start that stream session. In the background, we're actually going to transfer down the rest of the application local using BITS technology. So that, tech, that, that, that application is now local. What does that mean? Well, when I unplug my box and I go on the road, I've still got my Adobe Reader, I've still got my Microsoft Office. So in an offline mode, you're still up and running. So that's a little bit of the experience there. Now let's, talk, uh, let's take a look at the other part of the user interface. So one, we have, we have the system tray icon. We also have it where it will appear on the desktop, start menus, all of that good stuff. The final part of this, of this, uh, this solution is there's a portal. And this is the portal that you saw uh, in the keynote where a user can bring up the portal and see all of their applications that they're entitled to. SaaS applications, thin app applications, and even more in the future, other types of applications, right? But I also have this option for an application catalog, right? I needed to, uh, to go add an additional application to my, so I click my catalog, and in here I can find my VMware View client, right? I, I want to use that, I'll go ahead and activate that, or PuTTY or the vSphere client, thin app. I click on those things, 
And at that time, the entitlement engine kicks in. It pulls those virtual applications down to my environment. I have the icons there, and we're off and running. So now what happens if uh, you know, we've got smart users out there, and uh, maybe I, I, dis I make the decision as administrator. Uh, I looked at uh, you know, Aaron's computer, and uh, he wasn't really using Visio so much. Uh, used it once in a year, I think, to read that one email. So I'm going to take that back. Well, now, Aaron's a smart user, right? Aaron, he knows ThinApp, so he's going to take that shortcut, and he's going to take the package, and he's going to move it into another directory because that's how he's going to get away from my security. Well, the beauty of our technology is when you check that box as part of Managed by Horizon, we actually inserted a, a call into the package so that that package is always going to look for the agent. Now, although Aaron moved the package around so that when I remove it, it, it it's, it's a little bit of trouble for me, when he clicks that, age, that, that application, that Visio, it's going to pop up because, and notify him that, look, you're no longer authorized to, to use this app. So we're hooking at a level where we can guarantee that that entitlement is going to be right and based on what you set up in the Horizon App Manager. So that's, that's a, a little bit of a view into where we're headed with Horizon. Definitely some exciting things that will happen before the year is out, but that's not just it. This is just the beginning. You're going to see, going forward, continued cycles of releases. So we're going to work um, to, to bring out new capabilities um, you know, very soon, some this year and some really cool stuff coming into the next year. So start thinking about things like uh, how do I, you know, in, in Aaron's case, how would I have known that Aaron wasn't using Visio? Right? I wanted to reclaim that. Right? I want to be able to understand the licensing aspects of that Visio application. I want to reclaim it based on underutilization, things of that nature. So there's a lot more exciting things there to come. Definitely, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in the call to action. This is in the, uh, the, the booth down there, the VMware booth. You can see a live demo there. You can touch it. You can feel it there. It's also in the labs. So if you go to the labs, you can actually set up your Horizon environment. You can do some entitlements. Um, remove, remove those entitlements. So definitely check those out. So, Aaron. Kobe, before we move on, I have a couple of questions for you about this Horizon thing. Yeah. So what happens um, if I'm on um, my Mac, for instance? What's going to show up in my portal? Oh, you're going there. All right. <laughs> so uh, on my Mac, right, if, if we go back and we take a look at, uh, let's just go with this portal right here. On my Windows environment, I know right now that I can run all of these thin apps, right, an app is based on Windows. But what happens when I'm on a Mac? Well, today, th there's, there's no magic way to, uh, to take a Windows-based application and run it on a Mac, right? There's Wine, there's other, but truthfully, there's no way to do that right now. And that's where App Blast comes in. Um, we're, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on App Blast here. So before App Blast comes to market, you're going to not be, have the option to run those apps. But when App Blast comes to market, we're going to serve that that Windows application up to you in that other format. So yes, you could actually run your Windows apps from an iPad, from a Mac. But the key here really is, is that Horizon is aware enough that, to know the platform that you're Absolutely. running on and then can choose what delivery. So if I choose the Visio application, it's not going to download it to my Mac and then obviously not going to run. It's just going to it's gonna gonna air it out. Deliver it based on the, the, the type of connection and the type of platform you're on. That's okay. Right all right, so I've got one more question for you. Great. So that little button that we clicked earlier on the front, one of the things that people really love about ThinApp is that it's very lightweight, right? Um, people have been using ThinApps for, for a very long time. One, because it's a clientless, serverless architecture. It makes it very flexible. Does this mean that I'm going to have to use Horizon? Will I still be able to, to, to do everything that I can do today? You absolutely can. Um, so this did not make ThinApp suddenly have an agent. Horizon has an agent, but ThinApp does not. When you check the box that says, I want this to be a managed Horizon application, um, all we're going to do is tell that application, there's, there's a little bit of new code in there, to go look for this agent. So we didn't take and, and, and embed an agent in, in all of your ThinApps going forward. We're just telling the ThinApps, hey, be smart. Here's, here's a new call, and, and go look for this DLL. When you find it, it'll authorize itself back up with the Horizon service. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. There's another question. Yeah. yeah. Like, this, this is going to be both physical and virtual. No problem there. So you can take Horizon. It can deploy to the virtual environments. 
view, things of that nature, same physical, no problem. You'll be seeing a lot more things. Uh, we're going to try and save the rest of the questions for the end. We, 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 trust me, we put in plenty of time. Um, we brought uh, additional people with us today to, to take questions. Um, so save them, write them down. Feel free to share with everyone. But um, the, the deal is, is that Horizon is, is, um, is what we're, what, the portal that we're creating for the next generation of desktops. The fact of the matter is, is that everybody will tell you businesses still run on Windows applications. There are lots of SaaS applications coming to the market. There are more of them every day. But, the fa- but, but as all of us know, you cannot really escape Windows applications. And um, the analyst projections basically tell us that you won't be able to escape them for the foreseeable future. Right? We, have a, we, we see a, a declining number of them uh, from the forecasts, but they're going to be around for a very long time. As many of you, as many of you know, um, Internet Explorer six is what I mean. That's over ten years old now, right? And and one of the the big use cases that people still use today is virtualizing Internet Explorer six because they can't get away from that. And that in and of itself is just a browser. It's all the little plugins and, uh, that that of course go into Internet Explorer six that make it complicated. But if you can't get away from that when you're trying to move everything um, to web and SaaS then you know, just think about all of these business-critical applications that plug into Excel. So why do I bring this up? Because the reason is, is that um, the ThinApp container, uh, VMware, and the end-user computing gr- group sees ThinApp as, a, as the container um, that will help allow you to make your Windows applications more mobile so that you can transport them to the set next generation of desktops, right? And whether that is through Horizon or App Blast or something else, um, we, we, we know that the that ThinApp is a, is a very powerful, uh, lightweight uh, tool for wrapping up Windows applications and then making them more, um, more flexible and more mobile in, uh, in, the, in the environments that you're going to be using them in. Now, having said that, um, the very first time I ever saw ThinApp um, was in a small office in San Francisco where I watched somebody package up Firefox, and it was just a couple of clicks. And I still, you know, that, that changed my career. It changed lots of things, right? Like I thought it was one of the coolest things I ever saw because that just shouldn't work. However, and this is true, and I, I would like a, a show of hands. Um, when you give ThinApp to somebody uh, the very first time and they try Firefox or they try Explorer or they try... Um, something like that, they're like, oh, that's awesome. And the next thing that they do is they throw the most gnarly application at it that they can think of in their environment, and then they're like, oh, look, it broke. Right? Has, does anybody ever do that? <laughs> yeah, the rest of you are, 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 uh, are lying then. Um, LAUGHTER uh, <laughs> Because, because, but, and, and, and it, and, but it's true, right? Like, it's really stupid simple until it's not. Right? I love the thing, but it's stupid simple un- until it's not. And so one of the, the things that we're going to get into today is removing the barriers to adoption. Right? So what, we're, we're, we've been working on this for, for quite a while, um, and it, it essentially is the ThinApp factory. And this, uh, this came up today in, in Steve Harrod's keynote. And the reason that we're building it is, is because we know that packaging applications is, is, um, is difficult. Uh, now, application compatibility, I promise, it is the cornerstone, it is the pillar of every release that ThinApp that we do, and we work really, really hard to make sure as many applications work as possible, and we'll be doing some announcements um, at the, uh, just not everything can make it into these sessions, right, but we'll, we, we're doing some really critical work this year that, that should really um, uh, make even more applications work in the very near future. But, but still, you know, when you want to customize your applications and set them up for your customers' environments, you need something that's going to help you um, take these applications so that you can put them into Horizon and make them more flexible. And that's what the idea of the factory is. Now, we want to be able to run more jobs in parallel. So the idea, one of the things that the ThinApp factory does is you can point it at a directory. It will scan through them, find the applications, and attempt to... Um, uh, cr- convert as many of those into thin apps as possible. We've also put in a new um, GUI user interface that we'll get into because we recognize that um, you know I love the the text editor of package.ini, but over the years it is it has grown to 
um, something that is very difficult to look at. Um, and we have so many different options that um, uh, are available to you that you may not necessarily know because they're not exposed in it. Um, the package.ini setting would be pages long if we exposed everything that it, that it did. And, uh, and I know that um, you know, many of us have said, well, did you read the manual? Well, I read the manual because I have to read the manual. Do you all read the manual? Um, no, and, and a lot of people don't, right? So it would be better if we could figure out a way to expose all the little things that it did, right? So one of the other uh, big, big things for the ThinApp factory is um, exposing all of the little nuances um, in a really smart way. Um, and people have been asking this for years, right? And then um, what we did is, is that in, in 2009, we said, okay, well, people really want a new a new uh, user interface, and we could write that, and, and, and it would take a little while, and it would install, but, but why don't we just make it easier, too, right? So Jonathan Clark um, did a session in 2009 of the future of ThinApp where he demoed this product, and what he did is he said, okay, we've got a few virtual machines set up in the background, and we're going to point it at some, um, some MSIs that, that we have that are set to silent, and we're going to turn it on. Right, and what what we we, did, we demonstrated over this is what would have taken maybe an hour to an hour and a half um, for to convert these uh, these five applications. We did it in twelve minutes, and the way that we did that is is just by taking silent installations and some standard configurations and and, tr and flipping a switch. Now this was a very big hit um, with with the people in the audience, just as a time saver. Um, customers love it, packagers love it, you know, partners love it, um, consultants love it, because time is, is money, as we know, and anything that we can do to, re to, to remove the barriers to this, um, uh, we did. Now, I will be honest with you, this thing, if it, if it erred or you, know, you, you wanted to configure something, it, it wasn't really set up for that. But what it did do was um, validated the market for us, so we went ahead and built it. So. The thin app, um, and then, but we said, okay, well, we've got this user interface and this other thing that we can, what else can we do? Well, we don't want to distribute um, applications because that gets us into a business model that we really don't want to, we don't really want to go there. However, you don't have to necessarily distribute the applications if you, if you can tell somebody where the sources of those applications are. We also really don't, uh, don't want, uh, the, the, you know, VMware is very, very big on partners, right? So while we want to provide people with information on how to package applications, it's not really something that we're going to put up an army of people to do. ThinApp has always been a community-driven uh, product, and it's going to continue to be that way. So what about the recipes? Like, how do you do these things? Well, today we have the community forum, but we would really like to make that more interactive and more distributive to people. And the next thing is, is that people really loved the fact, the, this other thing that we built, which was the ThinApp Store, which was really just a way for people to look at applications. And what if you want to distribute your applications to your end users so that they can grab ThinApps on their own without having to, um, to buy Purchase Horizon? So we created the ThinApp Store. So oh, the factory in and of itself is a couple of things. It's going to allow you to, to identify application sources, whether they're internal or external. It will allow you to create feeds. It will then, and it will also allow you to publish them to something else, whether it's Horizon, an internal thin app store, or View. It will convert these applications if they're silent uh, MSIs. Um, it will convert them automatically, and if there's something that you want to go in and play with or that, that's not option or not available for that, you can bring up manual mode, which will come, which will give you a, a, a browser window with a virtual machine inside of it, and you can work within that. So that is the the new revised thin app capture. And then, of course, you're going to have a way to manage your applications so that you can, or your application projects so that you can go in and edit them later, apply templates, um, and, and basically manage the application lifecycle of your virtual applications. Does a lot of things. Um, it, it, is a, it, is, it will be shipped as a virtual appliance. It will be it is, um, compatible with, uh, with vSphere 4 and higher. It's also going to work with Workstation 8, which I encourage you to check out. It will be released very soon. Um, and the reason that it will be available for Workstation 8 is, of course, that even though it's a virtual appliance, we know that a lot of our biggest ThinApp um, um, users are our partners and customers and people that really just like to play with it, so they like to be able to take the thing home. 
So you can run an actual instance of the Thinet factory, of course, on your virtual machine. And then one of the greatest things about Workstation 8 is, of course, you can now migrate your virtual machines, your virtual appliances um, from Workstation 8 directly over into your uh, vSphere instance. Um, it will have an enhanced user interface for editing um, packages. It's all going to be web-based. It's not written in Flex so that you would be able to access it on your iPad um, or, or, or any other web browser. Um, it's going to have an auto import uh, for installer repository. Again, this is not going to automatically guarantee that everything will work right off the bat, but it will remove a lot of the, um, the tedious manual processes of just uh, converting applications for, for click-throughs and the installation time. We're going to ship it again with, um, with, a, with a virtual application store, unmanaged, of course, but, but it will be available and customizable by, um, by our customers. And the last thing is, is this, this, we want to introduce a few, the future generation of cloud services platforms, right? So we're going to introduce a concept of feeds with the ThinApp platform. And feeds are actually a number of, uh, it's, it's, they're, they're kind of like RSS feeds, which is where we got the name for them. But the fact of the matter is, is what they are is um, they are a way to automatically get um, uh, applications into the ThinApp store and convert them and, and, check for, and check back for updates. So um, um, we're going to ship this uh, as part of our beta program with a partner of ours called Ninite that you can go and check out. They're going to provide some feeds for us. Um, and it will just be a bunch of uh, 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 free feeds. And what the feeds will basically do is this is where you go get the, inter uh, the application on the Internet. So like Skype and Freeware and such like that. And this is how you convert it into a, um, uh, a silent installation. Many of you who have you probably used App Deploy or something like that will recognize it. And then, any, and then of course, if there's any Synapse-specific changes that you want to apply to it, this is part of the recipes that will also be included uh, in there. And then you would be able to select the things from this feed from a catalog to automatically convert them. We will, of course, uh, ship this uh, with, uh, with vSphere and view clients because wouldn't that be great, right? The whole idea is, is this is to get people on board so that you can automatically subscribe to these. Now, partners, um, you might be thinking that this is a great way for you. You would be able to create your own feeds. Feeds can exist from external or, or um, from internal. So you would be able to set feeds up on what we call our Exit 15 network, which is just a repository of internal, um, of internal MSIs. Um, then, um, so, so the feeds are, for, are, another, are another critical part of the ThinApp factory. And so, um, by the way, all this stuff is up in the lab. Uh, for you to for you to test out uh, in the hands-on lab, so I encourage you to to test it out. Our good friend Peter Bjork over here spent a, a great deal of time getting it all set up. Um, you can ask him as many questions about it as you want. He will uh, he will respond to you in excellent Swinglish because uh, he's the Swede over there that I was referring to earlier. Um, so the um, right as you can see up here, I've got the package editor. A GUI up, and we've exposed the package.ini a number of settings. So for all of you who have been waiting, here you go. This is a preview of the new graphical user interface for editing and updating in ThinApp packages. Good? You've also got it for registering the bottom. Oh, yeah. Um, by the way, uh, that's another thing. I... Um, the, this actually doesn't, doesn't show it up here for a screenshot, but uh, how many of you um, would prefer looking at registries uh, as, a, as, a, as a standard regedit and as a hive instead of on text files? That's <laughs> really, again, we've we we got half the room that's lying to me. Um, but, but uh, yeah, so, so we've exposed the, the registry as well so that you'll be able to drop down and check your isolation modes as a standard um, uh, 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 registry view. And then, I don't know, does my little thing right work over here? Okay, so we've got, again, we've got builds by applications, uh, st stage builds, published builds. Um, I mean, we, we really have spent a great deal of time uh, banging on this um, and, and making sure that it was, uh, it was uh, again, stupid simple because we want to make sure that thin creating thin apps remains uh, stupid simple. Um, this is what the feeds will look like. This will be open, right? So the idea isn't just that, that we want to that we want to leave this for for Ninite. It will be open for for, for people to create their own feeds. Um, when the beta comes out, we encourage you to go and try it and bang on it and and, and try and create your own um, to see if you can if you can do um you, you know you guys can make a business out of this as well. 
This is a, 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 a screenshot of the, the Thin App Store. Again, just a simple way for you to um, publish your applications from the Thin App Factory to, to a, a web uh, environment. As uh, Steve noted earlier today, you'll be able to publish this to Horizon or to the um, view as well. But if, if, uh, your, if your end user just needs to, a way for them to browse to get their applications, when they click on this, it will, um, it will actually uh, initiate a small bootstrapper that will download um, the ep executable and then do the registration that, you know, for, for ThinReg and everything else that you're, that you're familiar with. But it'll just do it automatically. Pretty good? I thought so. Okay, so um, to, I'm glad uh, I see that we've got 15 minutes left. Um, before I let you guys go and we turn it over to the Q&A, um, our call to action, right? One of, the, one of the things that, like I said, we really we wanted to get this out for you guys and have a conversation and have time for Q&A about each of these topics, right? But to go into more detail, Project Horizon, I, it's in this room. Um, today at 1.30, they will be going into even more detail on the... Uh, uh, on the architecture of how it's going to work so that you can get all of your security concerns and management and how do they do that questions uh, sort of out of the way. Well, um, Kobe and I will be doing some theater sessions uh, tomorrow um, about, uh, you know, one of them is going to be around uh, uh, ThinApp on, on Citrix and Terminal Server. We have another one on um, uh, ThinApp and how, it's, uh, how we've uh, um, worked with uh, AppSense. Yep. To, to create uh, better integration for virtual profile uh, management on AppSense. And then, of course, like I said, uh, we spent a, uh, some time allowing you to preview Horizon and, and ThinApp Factory in the labs. The beta will be coming out for ThinApp Factory in 2011. Um, can't give you guys dates right now, but it will be it will be this year, and we're very excited to have everybody try try it out and give as much feedback as possible. Because what you see up there is um, is right now I, literally is our best guess, and we're trying to narrow the target down to make sure that it is as usable uh, um, by by all of you as possible. Right? Like I said, we really want to keep uh, thin up to making it simple. And I th we went, we mentioned this today. The full. Um, so many of you might be familiar with PQR. They worked on the, uh, with us uh, on the um, performance testing that Fred mentioned earlier today. So please go to their, you can go to their website or Brian Madden um, to check out the results so that you know that we're not just, uh, we're not just making it up. And if Ruben's around, and is, did Ruben make it? I don't know. You can grab him and, and have him tell you um, also. So um, I would like to invite uh, Mike Morris and Jonathan Clark up on stage with, uh, with us uh, right now. Um, Jonathan is a principal engineer at VMware and uh, the founder of Thinstall, which was the initial original um, product that became ThinApp. Mike Morris um, is also one of our uh, uh, development managers, and he's been working. He and his team have been working with me for the past uh, almost a year now on um, getting the ThinApp factory up and running to where it is used up. So the mics are on. Um, I appreciate you guys saving all your questions. So so so, so please come up, and uh, of course, they would get in trouble if. I didn't remind you to please fill out your survey so that uh, all of us can come back and, uh, and talk to you uh, again next year. So the mics are open. Please uh, let us know if you have any questions. So can we ask questions right now? Yes. Uh, so uh, a question may be simple but nevertheless important. Can we effectively and successfully uh, virtualize Microsoft Service Packs? I mean, for Windows operating systems. Uh, so when uh, I, I have an example, so w when an application need, needs a Service Pack, so then uh, can we integrate the Service Pack and uh, the application inside the package? The, the question is, can we virtualize an application that might require something specific in a service pack? Yeah. And um, it's sort of a depends answer. It depends on what's in that service pack. There are some things in the service pack that might be uh, drivers or kernel uh, DLLs that you can't virtualize um, with the application. But there are a lot of things that are in service packs that would uh, virtualize fine inside of a ThinApp package. Do you have a specific application in mind? So if, uh, for example, uh, we want to virtualize uh, Microsoft Office uh, 2010, 
uh, and to uh, distribute it to the Windows XP or Windows 2000 operating systems. Can it be successfully done? Office 210, yes, we can support it on Windows XP, but not on Windows 2K. Is that, is that what you're asking? And uh, the question uh, was concerned that uh, fact that when we install Office 2010, it uh, needs ser uh, Microsoft uh, Service Pack. So uh, we should uh, insert the Service Pack into the package or no? What we do is uh, recommend capturing it on XP and that, that package will then run on Win7. So instead of going from Win7 and capturing there and taking it backwards, you, you capture it on the oldest platform and then bring it forward. And you would capture, because it's an older operating system, it would also install everything that it needs. For example, the, the activation service that's needed for licensing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we had two questions. One with the... Um, the GUI editor for the package INI settings, is that avail when is availability for that? Is it something you can announce? I can't, okay. unfortunately. All right. Um, Soon. Oh, it's encouraging to see. A lot of our customers, you know, as they're first getting exposure to ThinApp, the package.any from a, a text file standpoint is a bit overwhelming. Um, the second part is, is in large-scale deployments, um, we've started to get into SMB and SIFS performance tuning, and I'm wondering, is there anything on the horizon for publishing VMware best practices towards, you know, scalability limits as, as far as, you know, MTU size, jumbo frames, just different things with server message block and SIFs, you know, to help with large-scale deployments of a, you know, a central thin app repository. Okay. Okay, so the, the question is, um, you know, are we, are we doing a best practices for large deployments in Vue and, um, and how to, to tune that? And... The answer is yes. Okay. Um, do we? Do you know when that's going to be available, Peter? No, not really. I, I expect pretty soon. Okay. okay. Um, and and again, part of the reason that we're doing that like we showed off the the performance uh, today, the examples today, is because we want people to know that we're that we're taking this seriously. Um, unfortunately, it is still going to be a bit of a it depends answer because yes. you're going to have many variables on server and network. Capacity and, and all kinds of other things, and what particular applications that you're trying to run, how chatty they are, those kinds of things. But um, you should be able to gain some uh, some uh, initial uh, information on the the full the full PQR um, uh, white paper. Thank you. You're welcome. And for a lot of people, the the startup time is a, a very important factor uh, in applications and deployment success. And that's besides application compatibility. That's probably our our next most important thing. Um, we just had the 462 release come out, and um, we've you, if you try that out, you should see some some good performance improvements there. Um, we've got a lot more in the queue in the lab, so yeah, you know that's, that's something that we're definitely targeting at multiple levels, not just the the hardware, but what can we do in software to make that faster. When you're uh, capturing package through ThinAB, you showed there's a magical bullet for a Horizon service. If you create the package using the Horizon service uh, one, can that package only be managed within Horizon service, or you can still manage it uh, outside, like in the, just a regular uh, ThinAB uh, environment? So if, if you make a package and you want it to be managed by Horizon, the, the package is going to look for the Horizon agent. So if your question is, maybe I have uh, an Altiris or a Landesk or an SCCM configuration, can I still use that to deploy it? Yes, absolutely you can. Um, we, right now, um, in the first iteration that we're going to release with the Horizon, it's going to be about entitlement and deployment. So if you've got an existing tool that will deploy it for you, there's, you know, we're going to make additional value adds in the future, such as metering, license tracking, you could use Horizon just specifically for metering and license tracking, leverage your existing technologies, your SCCMs, to, to actually do the deployment. All we're going to look for is can we find that Horizon agent. So if you check the box, it's going to look for the Horizon agent. Um, one of the uh, problems we have today is uh, the comparison of streaming versus local. So we still have a lot of local workstation hardware, and yet we're moving into the view environment. Obviously on view, the best thing to do performance and management is to stream the app. But 
when you've got a lot of hardware sitting around, it seems kind of silly to continuously stream that app over the network if you've got local disk, local processing that you can take advantage of. I saw when you're talking about Verizon that it would have the capability to stream the app but also cache it locally when you're offline. Is there any plan to build some of that functionality into ThinApp itself where I can build a ThinApp package and say, look, I want to target the stream from my SIF share on the network, but I want to cache that content locally so that if I were to run this offline, it would still be able to execute? I mean... So the idea of what you saw with the Horizon was actually just downloading the application completely. So if you're talking about downloading it while it's running. And, and the trouble we're actually running into, we're, we're trying to create a similar environment between when the user sits down at a physical workstation and when they go to view. So if you sit down at your physical workstation and the thin app is registered locally and been copied locally, there's an icon pointing to somewhere on the C drive. Now I go over to view that icon needs to point somewhere out on the network. And so if, if the user let the registration control the icons, everything works fine. But if they were to manually create an icon on their desktop pointing to this application and they log into view, that icon is now broken because the registration of ThinApp didn't know about the icon, couldn't pick up on it, and couldn't change it to the new location. So that's a challenge we're having. And... If I could have something that was streaming off the network but still cached locally, it would kind of take care of that. Yeah, that is something we're thinking about. I think for, for Vue, there's two models that a lot of people use, the, the stateless uh, pool model and the, the one-to-one VM model. I think for the one-to-one VM model, that, that can make a lot of sense. For the stateless model, you end up hitting the disk a lot because... You're caching things that you're going to throw away when the user logs off, um, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense there. But uh, for the, we have three minutes. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll take the last question. Okay. If I create the thin app, just so it's used in, uh, you know, your app store or standard, do I have to repackage that again now to use it within Verizon? Yeah. So you will have the to horizon. repackage the. You will have to re, re, rebuild the application okay. when the Horizon model to, is to released. To add that layer yep. of. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you.